Hello, everyone. Let's get started with the next session. I think we had very good introduction from Mohan on the multi tenancy. From uh, myself, this is Vamshi Krishna Samudrala, uh, principal architect and enterprise architect for cloud engineering platforms for American Airlines. And Shravan Agnipali, product tech lead, Kubernetes platform team. Okay, so let's get started. How many of you had coffee this morning? <laughs> okay, so Shravan, a key question. What do you call a pot that runs on a coffee? It's a caffeinated? Yeah, it's a caffeinated container. So let's get started. Uh, so you can see a small logo. That's a Cape Pass, it's, which is called Kubernetes Platform as a Service. That's what is our internal branding of multi-tenancy cluster that we host at American Airlines. So our topic, navigating the multi-tenancy maze and avoiding the anti-pattern pitfalls. What we'll be discussing today? So we'll be discussing about what is a multi-tenancy maze and understanding the challenges of multi-tenancy, common anti-patterns that, that we go through while setting up the multi-tenancy implementations. And there are some pitfalls to avoid and uh, deep dive into anti-patterns, uh, lack of isolation, scaling, and something deep dive into lifecycle management of clusters and inadequate resource limits. If there are some inadequate resource limits, how to handle those? and some successful stories, what we went through in setting up multi-tenancy at American, and some key takeaways, and last Q&A. Okay, I think Mohan had introduced this slide already in his talk. Uh, this is Europe rail railway system, right? So this can be compared to a multi-tenant cluster. And I'm from US, I completely different from what we use, we use cards a lot and here the rail system. So when we compare to it in the context of Kubernetes, this can be compared to the rail system in Europe. So just as how the Europe rail system manages effectively and standardize the movement of persons and goods between various destinations, multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is that kind of concept which enables resource utilization, which enhances uh, scalability and ensures secure operations within the cluster. So this comparison, when I landed in Europe, I thought, okay, this is the best comparison what we can relate it to multi-tenancy. So let's pause it here, right? So this is a mind map diagram of Kubernetes maze. So if you see how many dimensions, if you have to maintain a Kubernetes multi-tenancy cluster, how many dimensions of it? So there is a there is an automation, there's troubleshooting, there's observability, networking, security, storage, and there are some miscellaneous concepts which you can see as an API gateway, disaster recovery, apart from control plane, if you're not using cloud hosting, then there's like a control plane, and there's a deployment that we need to take care of, whether it may be an on-prem, whether it may be cloud, and kind of nodes, and if you see how it branches out as a maze, right? So, how many of you remember still joining the maze in newspaper cuttings or somewhere, just passing from one source to the destination, right? But here, these branches in a maze, every branch in a maze affects in every other way. So we need to handle this maze properly. If you don't design it properly, it, it might affect the central whole system at all. So let's deep dive a bit on what are some common anti-patterns that we see implementing Kubernetes multi tenancies right so yes we have seen this morning mohan and uh, we talk about uh, from microsoft also just now we talk about network isolation so for for us we know namespace is a resource logical isolation of resources in a multi multi tenancy cluster but if we create the namespace are we secure are the tenants secure no they can use the resource quotas next come to the resource quotas right so unless until we define the resource quotas and limits for each namespace and pod we don't think, yes, they, are, they, they might use up the complete resources. So once we set up resource quotas and limits, we think we are, we are good. That comes the default networking where any part can talk to any part inside the cluster. So the network, the network isolation comes into picture. That is where as a service mesh or something that we implemented, right? But again, if we implement those also, there are other 
branches which we saw, DNS, the DNS, someone can abuse the cluster. A core DNS can be one application completely taken, core DNS also can run it, right? So like this, there are multiple aspects and multiple dimensions of it, of each, when we deep dive into. So there are three things which we listed. One is a limited scalability. Uh, when you design your applications for multi-tenancy, when you don't estimate the growth of the clusters, and when you don't know how are you hosting the tenants, there's always, uh, there's always, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a anti-pattern that we need to design it properly and you need to scale, you need to design for dynamic scaling rather than a static scaling. So that's one of the anti-pattern and the other one is overuse of global configuration. So another anti-pattern that heavily relies on global configuration that limits customization of the tenants. So where one action of one tenant can completely disrupt other, other tenants also. So this is one of other anti-pattern. And the other one is hard-coded dependencies. When we are not taking into account of our tenant needs, so something like a privatization rules or a localization or something like JADR or if it's a payment system, so there are PCI. So different kinds of tenants have different kinds of needs. So we should not localize something uh, for some tendencies, so that's why we want to keep it more flexible. We need to design such a way. So that is one of the common anti-pattern. Come back to pitfalls, right? What are some common pitfalls in, uh, in implementing the multi-tenancy? If you can see operational complexity, when we have seen those many things around the, uh, for setting up the tenancies, there are a lot of complexities that we need to design for. So we need to keep in mind that we should not overcomplicate the setup itself. Inadequate isolation, whether it may be as we discussed, whether the isolation may be at the logical grouping, networking or anything. So every layer needs to be secured. Ignoring security risks, you need to have well, uh, like you need to have the security taken into account. Maybe that may be vulnerability management or whether it may be scanning across uh, your clusters, pods, runtime scans. So you should not ignore the security risks that for your application because when you're setting up for multiple tenants, multiple use cases, improper dependency management and uh, resource contention. So resource contention, it's like, for example, take it as an overbooked hotel. So a hotel can take only the, from X number of customers, but if you overbook it, you cannot accommodate it. So we need to design it properly. Uh, there's always resource contentions. Uh, we need to plan ahead. Lack of cost management. So when there are multiple teams on the cluster, you need to plan accordingly to ch charge back and show back the costs. How are we meeting the needs of the tenants and how are we showing back? There should be, uh, there should be some mechanisms to just show it things out, right? So out of this, these are the common pitfalls, but there are always ways how we can address it. So there are always two different blocks which we can address by these pitfalls, either it may be with the tool or it may be with the best practice, right? So you should use a right tool for the right job, what we are doing it, or it may be a best practice. So the best practices are not like, I always discuss with Shravan, they are not like a butter that is spread on the bread, right? So it needs to be grown like a garden. So it takes time, but you need to in inherit those best practices into your thing, into your architectures. So the tools may be using resource limits and quotas, as we discussed, I mean, network policies, or RBAC controls, HPA or CADA, based on the event-driven, if they have an event-driven things, port security policies, or secrets management, centralized logging and monitoring because the observability needs to be centralized. It's not like each tenant needs to get something or the clusters, if they have specific use cases or backlog, you need to, you need to specifically move it as a centralized concept where the tenants can easily adopt to. Best practices, again, the namespace isolation, dynamic environment provision, you should be, we should be able to provision the ephemeral clusters uh, whenever uh, the customer needs, the RBAC policies again, Educating the tenants what we are bringing into the clusters or into building into multi-tenancies or whatever the new capabilities that we are bringing in, the documentation or the APIs, anything that we need to educate our tenants as we are bringing in. And the other thing is efficient resource utilization. So as we said, see, because we have, mul we have multiple applications sitting across whether it be one cluster or multiple clusters, we should be able to use the resources effectively. So. So these are the ways which we can avoid the pitfalls. Uh, but let's deep dive into a couple of topics. My, uh, my friend, Shravan, 
We'll take it up. Hey again. So let's uh, look at few dimensions of multi-tenancy. So some of the dimensions we're going to talk, uh, talk is uh, standard workload templates and workload types and how can we isolate these applications. And uh, one of the critical pieces is lifecycle management of these uh, multi-tenant clusters and uh, understand scaling. So let's get into workload templates. So there are few ways we can address workload templates. For example, we can have operators, either we can build custom operators that can, like we create our own CRDs and then that can create Kubernetes resources as per our need, or we can develop Helm charts, or else we can use customize so that you can deploy the same workload across different environments. We will dig deep into operators into and a demo into the next slides later. And workload types. So as we build templates, we can also incorporate workload types. Like some of the workload can be memory optimized or some of the workloads can be CPU intensive, right? So as we build templates, we can incorporate these workload types into the templates so that you have a standardized templates available for end users to use. So for example, we can use PCI or PIA compliant, which has more network needs. And in a multi-tenant environment, isolation is going to be a critical piece. As most of us were talking in previous talks also, there is a network isolation and there is a resource isolation. So let's take a resource isolation. So as we host multiple workloads in the same cluster, the isolation with its namespace level can be achieved using uh, resource quotas. So this way, if a single application cannot take entire resources, so as for example, if, it is, if a namespace is uh, taking two gig or two gig uh, memory, we can, we can limit it to two gig only so that all the resources are not taking, all, all of the re, uh, memory is not allocated to the same namespaces. And at the deployment level also, we can put uh, quotas for CPU and memory. For example, we can put limits for CPU uh, and memory so that all the deployment levels are not taking all the resources. Under the net network layer, we can uh, set uh, network policies, or if you are using any service mesh, we can use traffic permissions. And, and, and the next big thing is uh, lifecycle management. So in a shared infrastructure, lifecycle management would be a critical piece. So some of the aspects of lifecycle life management would be automate wherever possible and test it in uh, pre-prod environments before you send it, before you implement it in production and you have backup and uh, recovery strategy and you make sure you have observability and monitoring and you document as you uh, build these strategies. So I'll just spend a few minutes here. This is an example of a platform we built at American Airlines. For example, in this picture here, the developers come to an interland development portal called Runway, which is based off Backstage. And here they can create a namespace uh, in a specific cluster. And that namespace has quotas and RBACs assigned to it. Once the namespace is created, we have templates and workload types. They can choose a template. And once they choose a template, we will create a GitHub repo for them. And in that GitHub repo, we will have some custom CRDs deployed in it based on the user specifications. And then once the custom CRD is there, the Argo CD is going to take that GitHub uh, manifest files and deploy into the cluster. And on the cluster, we have operator that, you know, converts that custom CRD into all Kubernetes resources. So let's, let's look at a quick demo on how we can do this. Okay. So here I am, I'm creating a application or uh, into the cluster, deploying an application into the cluster. Here you could see this is a custom resource definition. So this custom resource definition has a standard templates in the background, so users don't have to really worry about, you know, defining all Kubernetes specs. So, for example, here, they're just specifying the image name, the port they want to expose, and the auto scaling policy, how many ports they want. So, I'm going to create a namespace where this uh, custom resource definition is going to be deployed. The CRD, we call it as a web app. So I'm creating the namespace here. I'm 
And then I'm going to deploy the custom resource definition here. So operator is one actually watching for the CRD that is deployed on this cluster. And once you could see that the resources are created in the background, this custom CRD is going to create all Kubernetes specific uh, resources with the uh, standard templates. And then we can also manage the lifecycle management, right? So for example, if a user want to change the resource quotas uh, or deployment quotas, we can expose this using the CRD or else if we want to delete these resources, you can still manage deleting these resources using these operators. So we repeat this process for hundreds of applications. So to make this happen, to, to, to build this platform, we have well, about 15 plus components deployed on our Kubernetes cluster. For example, some components are related to observability like Dynatrace, Mismos, uh, Fluentbit, and there are components like Velero, which is for backup and recovery strategy, and there are components for RBAC, like uh, Aptio Cloudability, or sorry, for cost management, uh, Aptio Cloudability, or else like Secrets Management, HashiCorp Vault, and Continuous Deployment, Argo CD. So, we, as, as I said, we repeat this process for hundreds of applications, and we have fleet of clusters which is set up to man, uh, su support this platform. So standardizing these clusters and uh, you know, lifecycle management would be a critical piece. So for this, uh, to simplify the process, we, we extensively used Argo CD application sets, where a single Argo CD application set would deploy all these 15 components on all of our clusters. So we manage all the manifest files for these individual components in a GitHub repo, and then we use a target revision version for each of these component and update the Argo CD application so that all these components are easily deployed across all of our clusters. And another consideration in multi-tenant is scaling. So as you know, when we create a multi-tenant cluster, uh, the dynamic scaling is so important for us. So some of the considerations we usually take into uh, scaling is like network plugin selection and uh, pod cider selection, or else IP allocated to your cluster, or else automated policy and monitoring them. So for example, we use AKS cluster. We started using a KubeNet plugin, which is a default uh, Azure Kubernetes plugin. So we identified that number of nodes that uh, this uh, plugin can choose is only 400. So we moved to uh, Azure CNI where the number of nodes can scale to more than 400 nodes. And then pod cider considerations. So some of the network plugins need to uh, need uh, needed a pod cider. So if you choose a small pod cider, that would translate to few number of uh, nodes. In the same way, uh, a cluster subnet assigned to the node as well. Choosing the correct cider would make you should make sure that we have enough nodes available when scaling needs are there. Once we enable scaling, we'll still have to monitor, make sure the scaling is appropriate. So. On our Kubernetes cluster set uh, in Azure AKS, we use auto scaling. Uh, so we enable auto scaling, and few few of the applications have a wrong configurations, where we end up uh, having more nodes. For example, a wrong configuration end up having about 20 nodes on a our fleet of our clusters, which cost which costs around ten thousand dollars per month. To avoid this we have to monitor and make sure the scaling is appropriate and address those needs. And then uh, this is a quick poll. If you guys can scan, there is there are a few questions you guys wanted to. Yeah, so let's, let's take this quick poll. We need your help. So let's get to this poll and see uh, some answer, some questions. So, yeah, let's see how many of you guys are using. OK. 
Okay, so. Yeah, so I think everybody answered this question, so let's skip to the next one. So let's see this one if, yeah. What is your preferred method of upgrading a Kubernetes cluster? Because we have gone through the lifecycle management. So we have seen, because we have gone through this cycle of either spinning up a net new cluster or putting your workloads completely, taking backup with LRO and putting it to the net new clusters and building up a net new cluster, preparing at, we thought we are preparing for a DR and we would do it for every other upgrades. But when your cluster grows, it's, it's a tedious job because now the cluster has grown, outgrown that doing that to a net new clusters or keeping up with an alternative pattern, maybe with Argo CD or AQT or keeping your application deployments like that. So we just want to see uh, the pulse of how your Kubernetes upgrades are, like spinning up a net new cluster or the in-place upgrades. What is working better for you? In-place is winning. <laughs> in-place is winning. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the next question, Sean. So how frequently do you upgrade? Is it as soon as a net new version releases from Kubernetes, you upgrade or with N minus two or N minus one, that may be a quarterly, half yearly, annually, or? I see some of us don't upgrade the clusters. <laughs> so this is one of the pitfall and anti pattern. So we need to keep up with at least in minus two. Questions? I'll, uh, we have some more topics, so I'll take the Q&A. So and this is the last question. So what is your preferred method of testing upgrades before applying them to the production. Okay, so it's other. <laughs> I don't know what, what goes into other, but yeah, so let's see. That's winning. <laughs> so this keep me curious to understand to understand why what's what's the other method that you guys are using it so but yeah thanks thanks a lot for taking the poll uh, that was very helpful for us to understand how the trend is so let's get to our successful implementation and our success stories a day right so where we have started so we have started the kubernetes journey like any other tenant uh, like five or six years before we have started with on-prem clusters and later moved into cloud as a cloud first strategy. And then with AKS completely, we host the clusters. But what we have seen with the trend of multi-tenancy is we have grown our multi-tenancy applications at a very rapid pace from last one and a half year. So it's almost like one less than one, one and a half year. When we started the multi-tenancy, there was a lot of individual clusters, which are dedicated clusters, at least for the small application, wasting the resources, because when you are spinning up a cluster, you need to spin up your system components, node pools for system components, and a node pool for your app workloads. So you can see here, right? So we did avoid spinning up the dedicated clusters, like a mushroom clusters, which are for a very repeatable workloads or standardized templates, which we can build up through front end. We are now hosting, this is uh, last week's data, we are now hosting around with the four, four clusters with east and west as well as the DR regions and with prod and non-prod across four clusters, we are hosting around 659 namespaces, 1,736 deployments. So this is a huge achievement for us where, where we started from one and one half year. Uh, so the, the, because of the cloud migration, which we are pulling it through, uh, this, this has been possible. And there's other story as we said we should not ignore what the customer needs are right so the pci so this is another there's a payment card industry uh, there are some uh, adhere rules that we need to uh, because aks by default is a public and we need to build a private connection clusters uh, with that when we open it up for a multi-tenancy we got more customers onto it one is a payment services and refunds application i don't know how many of you flew american airlines to come in 
I don't know. What, let's see, how many of you flew in American Airlines? No one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but uh, so the refunds application, whenever you have an issue, so those kind of, uh, when you call in, uh, those refunds and those kind of applications are still, uh, they're running on Kubernetes. So what we did for the teams that are running those applications are the time to market, because when the teams wanted to build their own clusters with their private, uh, private uh, networking and the security and other things, observability that we need to build across, it takes about three to four months to completely work with all the teams. But with our multi-tenancy clusters, they were, go, they were able to go live in one to two weeks. So that was a huge achievement. And uh, for the application teams that we are building through uh, with different kinds of workloads that we are, as Shravan mentioned previously, uh, different kinds of workloads, but different kinds of uh, clusters. It, it reduced complexity. It, for the compliance management, it was easy for the audits. And it has enhanced observability, which they did not work on. So there are some three conclusion, uh, conclusion and key takeaways for the day. So always embrace the best practices while navigating the multi-tenancy maze as we saw in the first uh, couple of slides, right? So there's a lot of, uh, lot of things that we need to take care. So we need to always embrace the best practices uh, for monitoring, securing, and managing the resources. There's continuous optimization uh, because optimization is a process. Uh, when the tenants ca come through it, the bin packing or uh, when you're giving the namespaces or uh, the quotas and everything. So there's always a optimization that is needed on the clusters. And we have uh, multiple sessions coming up, uh, how we did with the granulate and uh, how we set up our platforms for an optimization. Uh, across, watch out for those sessions. And stay vigilant against the pitfalls. So what are the pitfalls that we have uh, mentioned? It Stay vigilant against it. For all the developers, administrators, and architects, so there are always the potential challenges. We need to stay ahead of the curve. That's it. So now we are accepting all the queries, confusions, and Kubernetes confessions. <laughs> A small help. Uh, I think there's only one guy. So if you can raise your hand so that they can, he can come to you. Yeah, only one person. So one or two questions, maybe. Wow, the responsibility. Um, I was curious about your release pipeline. You you kind of showed that uh, you're using GitOps. Or you have um, basically staggering by regions. How many, tar how many clusters are you targeting p for any step? Because like avoiding a big bang but rollout the, is part of this. You meant this release? So, so all, of, all of our clusters are same. So we deploy the same version across all clusters. For example, if you are upgrading, uh, a component like a Grafana Cloud, right? The agent release, there, there is a new version. So the manifest files, we update the new image or any configuration changes, and then use the same manifest files and create a uh, target release and use the target release version across all the Argo CD applications. So all of our clusters are same versions. Oh, we are about 30 clusters. 30, 30, 30, zero. yeah, 30 clusters around it. Thank you. Thank you all, thanks.